Chapter 5 Poker Face Officer had long returned to his base, yet, before leaving, he didn't forget to remind Thien that the younger man wasn't allowed to wander around the Aka village that held too long tradition. The village entrance was decorated with a low kong, an arch made of hardwood or a long shot of bamboo with a beam over it, with engravings such as whirligig or a bird. No strangers were allowed to enter without permission, and the tradition stated that the visitors must wait outside until a villager came out to greet them, or they should call out for someone in the village to invite them in as a part of the tribe. But he had arrived in the night through the back entrance. If it was other communities who were more strict, he would be left to sleep roofless and had a real taste of forest camping. Luckily, Fa Pon Dao village seemed to be open-minded and welcome changes from the outside world. They'd made a decision to hold a welcome ceremony for the new teacher that evening. Kama Bieng Lei volunteered to accompany Thien back to his hut from the waterfall. On the way, the elderly man told him that Captain Fufa had asked him to ask young men in the village to fill water in the earthen jar and cook the meal even before dawn break. He had no idea, though, why the captain brought Thien to the creek that served as the village's laundry. Thien couldn't help but feel irked that the officer succeeded in pranking him. He gritted his teeth before muttering a sarcastic remark. Perhaps he wanted me to sweat a little. Well, I was surprised that he took on the responsibility of taking care of you. Have you known him before, Kruthien? The question stunned him. He hadn't known the captain before, but his heart had. Thien shook his head. Once they arrived at the hut, he thanked the elderly man for giving him freshly cooked sticky rice and dried salty beef he could fill his stomach with before the evening party. Having nowhere to go, he started with exploring the accommodation. First, he walked to the back of the hut and lifted the galvanized iron lid from the earthen jar to check, curious. Seeing how the jar was filled with fresh water, the handsome face frowned. He knew deep down that the massive officer was thoughtful and generous, but he couldn't help swearing at him after realizing that he had been tricked to walk a distance for a bath. Fuck. He slammed the lid down to let out his frustration. Luckily he had his immunosuppressants, otherwise his limbs would be shaking. Even if he had become physically healthier, his condition could rebound if he had strained himself too much. Tian went to look at the other side of the hut, a small single room built from woven bamboos tight enough to leave no holes to be peered through, was topped by a thatched roof. It stood alone with sparse forest as background. Once he opened the door, an unpleasant odor reeked out, and he saw a hole in the ground with a wood plank over it. The plank had a hole in the middle, an opening for human waste. Tian frowned, slamming the door and turning his back on the tiny room. The live hair looked more difficult than he had expected. He wiped the sweat from his forehead, feeling discouraged and returned to the empty space under the hut that served as a high-rise basement. A litter stood underneath the basement. On it stood a brazier that used charcoals as fuel, a pot, a pan with a dent, an earthenware steamer and a wooden jug in a cylinder shape with a lid that had zero ideas what it was for. The bottom of the pot was blackened but the interior was clean, ready to use as if someone had already washed it. Maybe this was a message to him that it was time to cook for himself. The end slumped down on the litter, deflated. When he first joined a scout camp as a child, he was entrusted with a cooking duty that he didn't want to do. It turned out that the rice he made was uncooked. The omelette burned and the fried chicken was still bleeding. No one allowed him to do anything after that incident. He would starve to death. Tian was crestfallen and wanted to pack his bags to leave right away. He climbed the crumbling stairs back to his room but chose to stay outside. The cool breeze and the warm sunlight calmed him down as he sat on the porch, 
leaning against a pole and hanging his feet down, looking over the swaying trees. He was slowly falling asleep until a familiar voice spoke up. Kruthian? It was Sergeant Yod. The soldier was wearing a green khaki t-shirt and an undershirt for the camouflage gears, which meant he'd completed his shift. Thien rubbed his eyes, drowsy, and answered a few breaths later. What's up, Sergeant? It's 5 p.m. Everyone ready for the welcome ceremony. I'm waiting for you in the yard. Please come with me or we'll miss the auspicious time. The city boy nodded and lazily stretched. He bent down to tie the laces of his sneakers. You don't have to make it a big deal. It's Akka tradition. They're being kind to you, so all you have to do is accept the kindness. Don't overthink it. The soldier, who was at the same age as his father, gave him a wide grin as he was getting ready. Seeing you now in the light, you're just a boy. Tien lifted his hands to comb his messy hair, feeling nervous. Usually, he always kept his appearance perfect from head to toes, with spotless and stylish clothes to appear well-groomed. But here, being stripped of all decorations, he was just a normal guy who had recently grown out of his teenage years. He didn't know how to behave as the older soldier teased him with such kind-heartedness and friendliness. The flawless cheeks reddened with embarrassment and he changed the topic of the conversation. Why don't we just go straight to the village? Sergeant Jod was taking the young man along the bypass to the back entrance, answered. The ceremony will be held at the village front, that's why we're taking a detour. The sun was setting down, the orange hue descended over the mountain ranges and the cold air washed over the village. Thien pulled his jacket tight to keep warm. The temperature had dropped all of a sudden, yet he still felt warm because he was on his feet. He realized that once he would stop walking, he would be frozen until his jaws locked. The senior sergeant took him to a rocky slope and pointed upwards. You go up there from here. It's not far, just half a kilometer. Once you see the village entrance, you shout and ask for permission to enter. Aren't you coming with me? I can't. You have to go solo from here. I'll cut through the forest and join the others who are waiting for you up there. Keep your hands to yourself and do not touch anything. The sergeant spun around and headed into the dense forest before disappearing out of view. One could easily get lost on such a route if they weren't accustomed to it. Being left alone, Thien scratched his head, not knowing what to do for a good few minutes. He patted both the cheeks to cheer himself up. Fuck it. He had come this far. Let's get going. The new volunteer teacher strode against the cold wind and light fog that was hanging low in the air. Darkness slowly crept in. The sound of tall grass rubbing on both sides of the track created a scene from a horror movie in his head. Dan sped up his paces that he could be running with fright. At the end of the steep track, a long dark shadow cast downward. Once he got nearer, Thien saw that it was an arch made of strong wood poles. A thick beam sat atop, decorated with engravings in the shape of swords, birds, and whirligigs. Near the poles stood two carved wooden statues that appeared to be a man and a woman. He gazed through the darkness deep into the arch. All he saw was rows of vaults leading to the entrance. He was surrounded by total silence and no other souls were waiting for him as the soldier had mentioned. He suddenly felt chill and goosebumps as he now remembered a documentary about the hill tribe's beliefs in spirits and ghosts. The eerie solitude gave him a fright. He couldn't move his jaws as he was plagued by his own imagination and words got stuck in his throat. Thien pinched his eyes shut digging nails into his palms to calm down. May I enter? Silence, like a ghost town. A few seconds later, he heard whispers in a peculiar native tongue, one he couldn't decipher. The voices echoed back and forth on the mountains that embraced this place. It appeared on his left, then right, and formed into a single low hum that rose up around him. The place was haunted, for real. 
Before the city boy would be shocked by terror, he heard a familiar deep voice. That's the loudest you can give? All his fear vanished right there, replaced by irritation. The last string of his patience snapped. Fuck, is this some kind of boot camp hazing? That massive sod, Fufa. The end shouted back into the dark without a second thought. Just come get me, my balls are freezing. Everything fell into silence again, as if they were translating his words. Then loud laughter shot out from behind the dark, tense thickets of trees, followed by flares of torches that lit up the whole space, chasing away the fear and the coldness from the freezing temperature. A group of men dressed in hand-woven indigo long-sleeved t-shirts with colorful embroideries in three rows at the hems emerged from the woods with wide welcoming smiles on their faces. Thien was in no mood to socialize, so he gave them a dry smile and darted through the entrance. He spotted some people in odd clothes along with Captain Fufa, Sergeant Jod, and some soldiers he hadn't met before. Before he opened his mouth, Kama Bieng Le, another young village man, ushered him towards a big yard with a blazing campfire in the middle. Women who were fully dressed in skirts with similar patterns to the men's shirts and pointy hats with the yarn bunch on top, decorated with silverware that jingled and chimed like bells as they moved, waited right there with children. Yao Ma, or the spiritual leader of the Akka village, stepped towards the newcomer. The wrinkles on his face exuded the air of sternness that demanded reverence, and Thien couldn't breathe from nervousness. The elder lifted an intimidating, convoluted, and bumpy wooden staff and swirled it around his face, chanting a mantra in a raspy yet powerful voice. At the last words, the staff with a surface that looked like toad skin narrowly hit the middle of his head. Tian tucked his neck and lifted his hands into a vai above his head, pleading and protecting himself at the same time. A thick can gave him a soft pat on his back. Don't be afraid, teacher. Yao Ma is giving you a baby shower. Kama Biang Le smiled, amused at the young man's alarming reaction. Hearing a sentence in a language he understood, the city boy's anxiety subsided. He lowered his arms and the tip of the staff tapped him right in the middle of his forehead. It didn't hurt at all. Thien slowly pried his eyes open and looked at the elder who was smiling at him. He was a benevolent man, after all. The younger man tapped his forehead and felt a sticky, wet substance on the tip of his finger. It's red lime. Yama sealed it on you to protect you from the evil spirits in the forest. Biang La explained, and Thien let out a big sigh of relief. The music from local instruments, led by a la ja, or a reed mouth organ in an odd shape, followed by a three-hold flute called chulio and a tom-tom, started playing. Even if it was a welcoming ceremony for the new volunteer teacher, the occasion was when young men and women in the village could have a social interaction. They sang and danced around the campfire, and Thien was reminded of the scout camp. Bien Lai and the village elders bound colorful threads on each of his wrists as a blessing and the invitation for his spirit to reside within the body. They didn't use holy white threads commonly seen in such ceremonies. It was unfamiliar and yet just as beautiful. The end lifted his hands awkwardly to perform a why, not being used to receiving kindness from strangers. They were from different worlds in both languages and lifestyles. Then, the last man to give him a blessing showed up with a red and white tassel in his hand. He was still upset with being pranked to act like a fool at the entrance, and slipped out the cutting words. Whose daughter are you married to? Do you have the right to be called one of them and give me this binding thread? The intense dark eyes glanced at him as the captain started winding the tassel around the fair skin. I did get offers to marry one but I didn't say yes to anyone. The deadpan answer got on his nerves. 
It wouldn't hurt if you act a little humble, Captain. Captain Fufa didn't say a word as if he was disinterested in nonsensical, verbal ping-pong. He tied a loose knot, intended it to be easy to pull apart, but the yarn kept loosening up. Thien was tired of holding his hand up. It's all right. You can make it tighter. A new, soft, deep voice cut in. So you two can be bound till your next life? A tall, fair-skinned young man appeared by the captain's side. The vitty, mischievous, almond eyes behind silver frames stared at the yarn on Thien's wrist and blurted it out. Red yarn? Well, well, my boy Fu. You just want to get engaged to him right now, yes? He finished with a loud snigger. The captain, who finished tying the knot, turned to glare hotly at his friend. Cut the crab and get lost. I won't. The other man shot back and turned towards the new volunteer teacher, a slender and neat-looking young man. He gave Thien a sly smile. Hello, Nang Thien. I'm Vasant, a field doctor at the same camp as this monster. You can call me P. Dr. Nam, like others do. So he wasn't the only one who thought Fufa's height was unusual for average Thai men. Tian felt an instant affinity with the field military doctor. It seemed he had the same personality as Tai Chin's, even if a bit more playful. Hello, P. Dr. Nam. He raised his hand to perform a vai without any hesitation. Fufa crossed his arms as he looked at the rascal who had a big smile plastered all over his face, feeling irritated. Why was Thien acting out with him? It made him want to whip the boy's buttocks with a stick, but behaved with others. The young officer let out a heavy sigh. Come on, Uncle Bieng Lei and everyone are waiting to have dinner with you. He gestured towards the litter that stood at the edge of the yard where all the village elders were seating. Kama Bieng Lei ordered his men to put another letter next to the first one so the soldiers could join in. Apart from Captain Fufa, Dr. Vasant, and Sergeant Jodkai, there were two other rangers from the militia. Usually, the militia was local and the two were familiar with the villagers because of the same tongue they shared. The young captain, who had been stationed at Fafa Piran operating base for years, spent enough time with the locals and blended it well enough, he was considered one of them. It wasn't a surprise that the villagers gave him the honor to bind the newcomer's wrist as one of their respected elders. Sergeant Jod even gave him an intel that it was Captain Fufa who pushed the educational program for this Aka community, so they could be literate in the Thai language. Knowing how to read and write would help them from being conned by city men which was a common occurrence in the past. When the school was funded four years ago, the villagers flocked in to study. Once they were educated, the forward-thinking youngsters went down to the city to find a job. The captain wondered if he made the right call, and the program almost got called off. But the poor kids, they just wanted to study. What's wrong with getting a job in the city? Once they earn more, they will have a better life, won't they? Thien asked, confused. Sergeant Jod turned and gave him a knowing smile of someone who'd seen the world enough. If all the young people leave, and all the remains are the old and the children, can we still call it a village? The purpose of this school is to educate people in remote areas, so the younger generation can develop their hometown and save it from being taken advantage of by investors and er, or middlemen. At least they can communicate in Thai. Maybe they'll be gone for a while and return. He knew his opinion was too optimistic. Making money by doing less strenuous than farming? Who wants to come back? The response didn't come from Sergeant Jod, but for someone who was mentioned in the conversation. The city lights are terrible yet beautiful. Upcountry foes can't help but be drawn. Captain Fufa stared deep into the brown almond eyes. Besides, I haven't met any city people who can live with the quiet, unglamorous life in the jungles. 
The straightforward statement made Tian turn away, and he looked at the local dishes that Uncle Bian Lei's wife had put before him. The food on the woven bamboo tray looked delicious. Grilled chicken, chili paste with half-boiled vegetables, plain soup, rice, and sticky rice. Nothing out of the ordinary that he couldn't eat. My wife has cooked this dinner especially for you. Nam Pri Gong isn't too spicy. Here, have a try. Kama Bian Lei pushed the half-boiled vegetables towards the VIP guest of tonight's dinner gathering. Tian went silent, pondering something. Then he picked the most familiar veggie and dipped it in the chili paste that resembled spaghetti sauce. They even tasted alike as he chewed on the food and gave it a compliment. Very delicious. But how did you know I don't eat spicy food? Bian Lei didn't catch the calculating question and gave a straight answer. The cab. But a deep voice interrupted before he completed the word. Daka put a handful of chili in their jungle food. A city boy like you won't be able to handle it. Fufa turned towards the village chief. Is that right, Kama? Yes, that's right. If your tongue isn't used to the spices, you'll have an upset stomach. Bian Le answered and forgot that he wanted to say a moment earlier. So, Nang Tien should have grilled chicken and a beer with me. The military doctor cut in. His voice slurred from the alcohol and grabbed Tian's shoulder as he lifted an open can of beer towards the younger man. I told my guy to go down to the city at dawn and buy this just for you, you know? As the fermented yeast scent touched his nostrils, Tian's mouth watered. The former party boy had to say no to the alcoholic drink with deep craving and regret. I can't drink. Are you kidding me? Vasan looked at the man in his arm. The guy didn't appear to be a prude. Had he misjudged the boy? I'm not kidding. I'm allergic to alcohol. It gives me rashes and I can't breathe. Tien gave a sheepish smile and put a bowl of sticky rice into his mouth, being too aware of the intense, inquisitive stare from the poker-faced officer. Dog, don't overdose. You're a lightweight who just overestimates himself. Fufa pulled the arm around Tien's slender shoulder away, perhaps too forcibly, because the drunken doctor swayed and dropped his head on the strong shoulder instead. Why is my head spinning? The fair-skinned doctor from a Thai Chinese family reddened up, and he looked quite charming under the glistening light. The young captain shook his head, a slight smile tugging at the corner of his lips. He looked partly concerned, partly fed up. The new volunteer teacher looked up, caught the moment, and the chicken leg almost flew out of his mouth. A freaking broke back mountain. Tien pushed the horror out of his mind as the captain pushed the doctor's slack head away, lulling towards the sergeant with a grunt. Who bought you the beer? I'm going to interrogate them all. Dr. Vassan was defeated by his own biological building blocks and passed out. His companion took the trouble in taking him back to the operating base before the party was over. Tien looked at the massive officer who was carrying his friend away. His mouth fell open as if to say something. Still, he didn't utter a word as the two shadows vanished in the darkness. But you said you'd see me later. The thin lips pressed tight into a line. What a moron. He lifted up a bowl of soup and put it to his lips, gulping with frustration, but that made Bian Lai's wife pleased with herself, and the village chief clapped his hands in delight thinking that the new teacher was enjoying the myriad of dishes specifically prepared for him. Tien's stomach was close to bursting. The clock struck at 9pm. Looking around, he saw how the villagers were returning to their home one by one, since the farm work awaited them when the roosters crawled at dawn. Only the elderly men stayed for more homemade booze and talked among themselves. Sergeant Jod and two rangers were hammered and were almost crawling on the ground. He didn't know how to handle them, so he left the matter to the villagers. The end said goodnight to Kama Bian Lei, whose central dialect was leaving him as the night went on and quietly left the culture yard. 
this Aka community was small and simple that the Yen didn't have any trouble finding his way back to his lodging. He followed the torches that were lit along the route and spotted the tiny roof of his hut once he passed other houses. Then he stopped in his track. The hut was lit. It meant someone went in without his permission. Having a rash judgment, it didn't occur to him that if it was really a thief, he would be in danger. The end's slender form strode up the stairs and yanked open the woven bamboo door, and he got stunned by what he saw. The intruder, who was kneeling in front of the kerosene lamp, slowly turned towards him. Captain? The end stuttered, and Fufa frowned at him. Why was the boy acting as if he was seeing a ghost? I refilled the benzene for you. You can turn the lamp off if you're not using it, you know that? The officer showed him how to turn off the valve, not caring whether the other man was listening. Yen couldn't hold back his smile. He rubbed his face a few times to calm down and asked, How did you get here? With a motorcycle? Surprisingly, he wasn't annoyed with that crisp, deadpan answer like he normally was. Haven't you returned to the base with Doc Nam? The young captain fell into brief silence before saying something that made Thian's heart skip a beat. But I gave you my word. What about the Doc? He was, uh, throwing up in his room. Fufa started to lose his temper. Are you worried about him? Thian pulled a wry face, annoyed. It was you who were worried about him. Too worried. The captain pondered why the city boy started a fight with him and came to a sudden realization. You thought I forgot the promise. The words shot right through him and the smooth cheeks reddened. The end's mouth fell open before he blurted it out. What? Me? No way! How would you even think that way? Seeing how the younger man vehemently rejected the statement, Fufa shook his head lightly, murmuring, Kid. Tian was so embarrassed and wished the earth would swallow him whole. He decided to change the subject before the other man cornered him again. You said you'd teach me how to hang the mosquito net. The massive officer rose to his feet without putting up any more fight. He pulled the ropes that hung the net loosely. It's easy. Just pull the four corners and tie them tight. He waited for the newbie teacher to try, but the other man didn't move. I don't want to mess things up. The net's old. I don't want to break it. So you want me to do it for you? The officer aimed at sarcasm, but didn't expect the end to give him a quick nod. Fufa let out a heavy sigh and nimbly pulled the net straight. When you're going to bed, tuck in the four corners under the mattress so the insects cannot crawl in. Is he blind or something? The holes are bigger than the insects. The end lowly muttered to himself, but the captain's head whipped around. What did you just say? Nothing. The end waved his hand, quickly rebuffing. What should I do next? Fufa cast him a suspicious glance, but went on giving the instructions. Once you wake up, you roll off the corners and rest them on top of the net to keep them off the floor. He gave a demonstration by pulling the tips of the net and rolling them to rest in the middle of the rectangular frame. If I pull the net down and tuck it under the mattress, won't it trap all the mosquitoes inside? Well, there's a simple solution. Just use the blanket to burst them away. The captain picked up a blanket, swung it in the air, then pull down the four corners again to tuck under the mattress. First, you tuck in the three corners. You can finish the last one when you're going to bed. This will leave no opening when you want to go in and out of the net. The man was meticulous, just like his dad. Even after his retirement, the former general still neatly folded his blanket and placed it at the end of the bed every morning. The end whistled to the impeccable work before him. Thanks a lot, Captain, for your mosquito net service. I'm going to brush my teeth and wash my face at the jar at the back of the hut, since the water is now 
so far. He emphasized the last words to imply that he already found out about everything from Kamabiang Lei. It took a while for Captain Fufa to realize that he had been duped by the rascal to do all the work for him. The boy even taunted him for making him walk to the waterfall to bathe. Yet Tien was already humming happily as he left the hut. The handsome face twisted as the officer balled his fists. He would have punched a hole in the fragile floor right now if he could. Finally came the day to start working as a volunteer teacher. Kama Biangle took a breakfast pinto to the new teacher's hut at 70 a.m., only to find that he was still wearing the clothes from the previous night. Thien smiled sheepishly at the village chief. He already tried to take a bath, but the earthen jar made the water too freezing for him, so he only washed his face and brushed his teeth. The weather here is quite cold, he said, trying to hide his embarrassment. You'll get used to it. It's going to be even colder next month. It's going to be colder? The end grimaced. He always turned on the water heater at home, and this place didn't even have electrification. How long could he survive? In some coldest years, the temps drops below zero. Bian Lei made it sound worse to tease the young man who was curling up into a ball. How could you handle it by not taking a bath? The village chief laughed. We'd all get eczema if we don't. Here's what we do. We boil the water and mix with the room temperature water and we get the warm water. You've got a stove under the hut, haven't you? I saw, but I don't know how to use it, he confessed. Don't worry, I'll tell Captain Fufa to teach you how to light the fire. Hearing the captain's name, the boy scowled. Why him? You can teach me yourself. Because the captain takes good care of you and I don't want to steal his job. Bian Lei answered humorously, but it made the younger man's scowl deepen. Tien didn't want to argue, so he started munching on the food, freshly cooked hot boiled rice with tons of vegetables, uncaring if his tongue would get blisters. Kama Bian Lei took the new volunteer teacher along the route that led to a small school where children in Fa Pan Da and nearby villages studied together. It was located on a high spot on the cliff that was a kilometer on foot to reach. After a while, Thien heard the Thai national anthem with a slight accent coming from the distance. The rectangular flag that was waving above the thick scrub ahead made him stop in his track, looking up. Thai national flag. The old faded flag that had been used for a long time slowly slid up the pole which was a simple bamboo stalk with a pulley. It was a familiar sight, but how many people knew the real meaning of this flag? Our ancestors loved this land, you know? Bian Lei asked. Seeing how the younger man was standing still, he stepped closer with a proud look on his face. Without this land, we wouldn't have home, and would have become vagabonds, someone without nationality and safety. This must be the different world people had talked about. He remembered the time from elementary school to high school where students were forced to stand in the yard under the scorching sun just to sing the national anthem every morning. He remembered cursing at the rules and regulations that made his student life so unpleasant. He never appreciated it all and never understood why. He even made a plan with his friends to take down the flag from the pole and hide it. Yet, the people who lived in the remotest outback were contented to have a chance to sing the Thai national anthem. Let's go, the children are waiting to meet you. Many of them came here today just to see you. Fa Pan Dao, village chief, patted the skinny back to signal that it was time to move again. Even if it was called a school, it was something beyond his comprehension. The school was a mill with bamboo structures and attached roof. The three walls were made of strips of split bamboos, with a hole as a window on each side to let the light in. And the fourth wall was covered with a medium-sized blackboard. The floor was covered with mats. Ten makeshift desks stood inside without chairs. 
and the students had to sit cross-legged on the floor to study. The children lined up in front of the flagpole, from the tallest to the smallest one, with two rangers Thien had met last night standing nearby. All of them were staring at the new teacher with hopeful eyes. Seeing the innocent eyes shining with bright hope, Thien was struck by a sudden nervousness and turned towards Bieng Lei. Um, you said they were many, but what I saw wasn't more than twenty. This is already quite a number, teacher. The children need to help the parents work the field. On some good days, you'll be lucky enough if five of them show up to the class. Thien nodded, not wanting to argue, and stepped to stand next to the flagpole, along with the older man. Kama Abyeng Lei announced something in Akkad native tongue that he understood nothing of, but he knew it was about his presence. Later, the children flocked into the classroom and sat down on the floor as well-behaved students did. Let's get inside. Bieng Lei led him to the blackboard where a box of white chalk was placed on a bookshelf nearby. Please introduce yourself, Kama told the younger man. But I can only speak the central dialect. They'll understand. Some of them are fluent in Thai, especially the tallest one over there. Bieng Lei gestured towards a boy at the back of the classroom. He wasn't older than fifteen. Thien rubbed his neck. His throat felt like lead, and he was unable to utter a word. He didn't see himself as a teacher, not mentally or physically, yet he had to introduce himself as one. I'm, uh, my name is Thien. I'm from Bangkok. Nice to meet you. Savadika came from the children, and suddenly his heart swelled. Now, each of you should introduce yourself to Kru Thien. Bieng Lei spoke in Thai, and the Akka kids took a turn to say their names. Some were in their native language, and some were in Thai. The village chief had told him earlier that some parents had worked in the city and gave their children a Thai name in their birth certificate. Kru Thien, I need to excuse myself. The school finishes at 3 p.m., but if you want them to do some extra activities, just tell them when. The village chief gave the new teacher an encouraging smile. It was obvious this was his first job. The elderly man excused himself to leave, waving his hand goodbye, and Thien stood awkwardly with a dozen pairs of curious eyes staring at him. Um... He didn't know where to start. Maybe the alphabet... He hadn't written down the first to the last alphabets in ages. How could he recall all of them now? But before the staring contest went on any further, the girl spoke up in a clear, tiny voice. Kurtien? Is Tien the same word as crayon? The man who stood still in front of the class processed the question and answered, No. He didn't know how to explain, so he turned around and wrote on the blackboard with chalk, something that was rarely used in schools in Bangkok nowadays. The slender fingers moved the white chalk slowly, not used to it, and contorted Thai alphabets appeared on the board. The N. This is how it's written. With a different spelling, it means a prophet. What color is a prophet? A prophet means a wise one. He tried his best to keep the explanation concise, yet the kids still didn't get it. Why can't it be a crayon? Thien mentally raised a white flag. All right, it's a crayon. Crew crayon! The other kids who pressed their ears to the conversation blurted the name out in unison with giggles. So, what are we going to learn today? The children seemed to be accustomed to the new teacher, hence the second question. What to learn? The city boy stood stunned as the words of Kruv and Eyes, the director of Song Thong Foundation, echoed in his mind. Children's ages varied greatly here, so it was problematic to construct a study plan to fit them all. What did your previous teacher teach you? It was an easy way out, but the Hill Tribe students spoke up at once trying their best to give him the answer, and his head started to spin. Thien lifted his hands to stop them. 
Tomorrow you guys take the notebooks with the homework assigned by the previous teacher to me. Once the children nodded, he let out a long sigh of relief. It seemed he was going to make it today, after all. Tian looked around and spotted a glass cabinet with drawing books and boxes of crayons inside. A light bulb went off in his head. All right, this is the first day we meet, so I want to get to know you better. He called the students of varying ages to sit down in circle and put pieces of paper with crayons in the middle so that they could share. I want you to draw a family picture for me. When you finish it, you can go home. We will meet again tomorrow. That's it? Daka children's eyes asked the question as they looked at crew crayon puzzled. Yet they began drawing as told. Tien watched as children started drawing pictures on the papers with the crayons and stepped away from the circle to sit down on the window frame that was as high as his waist, feeling tired. The cool breeze on the cliff wiped away the sweat from his smooth forehead and the edginess he'd felt earlier. Outside, the two rangers were patrolling as if terrorists' attack could break out on his steep hill at any given moment. Tien rose up to walk and sat down many times for an hour or so when a boy nudged at him. He remembered the boy's name to be Aji, age 14, and he was the biggest boy in the class. Here's my homework. Though boy's Thai accent was flawless, perhaps he had studied with many volunteer teachers since the birth of the school. Thanks. Tian took the paper and saw the drawing of a mountain range with the sun in the middle. A house stood in the left corner with human figures holding hands on the right. A family portrait. Yet, apart from the figures wearing Akka costumes within unique rectangular patterns, there was also a man in a camouflage uniform and a young woman in a long robe with a flower behind her ear. Who's this? He pointed at the soldier figure, curious. It's Captain Fufa. Why is he in the picture? Dad told me the captain always helps us out, so he's family too. The boy answered honestly. And who's the girl? He pointed at the figure that stood out from the rest. Krufan. The name that came out of Aiji's mouth vaguely reminded him that Thorfun had written about an Akka family of one student that had taken her under their ring during her time at Fa Pandao. They told her to call them Ada, Dad, and Ama, Mom. Do you miss Krufan? He didn't know what made him ask that. The boy's innocent eyes made him miserable. Did they know that their beloved teacher couldn't return, not in this lifetime? Aji nodded. I do, but she promised that she'll be back as soon as she can. The boy's answer sent a chill down his spine. It's waiting in vain, without any miracle. Tien absentmindedly lifted his hand to touch his left chest. In fact, she had returned to them, but only in the form of his heart. Kru, Kru Crayon! The one who called him was a girl who had given him the new nickname. The tiny little one ran towards him. It's done! Two soiled hands thrust her proudest work at him. The end frowned as he saw the exact same characters like the ones Aji had drawn. Who are these figures? Me, you? The little one pointed at herself, then at the bigger boy next to her. P.I.G.? She started pointing at the each figure that was drawn in uneven lines. This is Dad, Mom, Captain Fufa, and Crew Fun. So these two were siblings. The city boy came to an understanding that he couldn't really tell who was related to who, since all of them looked the same to him. He would believe if they told him the whole village were cousins. Aji, made you. Now you've handed your assignments, you may go home. I'll see you tomorrow, all right? Miju smiled widely, happy, and turned to speak to her brother in their native dialect. Aji raised his hands to Vai, the new teacher, and took his sister's hands as they left. It was the afternoon when the other dozen children finally completed their tasks. 
You finished early, one of the rangers said as he peered into the empty classroom. The end smiled sheepishly. How could he tell him that he didn't prepare any material? The first lesson starts tomorrow, but are military guards really necessary? He asked what he was wondering about. The younger ranger was quiet as if to think. We're at the borders. It's not somewhere we can call safe. That vague answer didn't bother him. The end collected all the papers and picked a few textbooks from the cabinet to bring home with him. He left the school with the two rangers who took him home before returning to the operating base kilometers away.